are going to work with something unsafe, ultraviolet light. Now, you know I take safety very seriously, and normally I'd avoid a project like this, but I think there is a real need that balances out that risk. I'll get into that in a minute. That said, this is not a project to take on casually. Make sure your kids know UV is not a toy and they do not have access to UV light sources. My buddy Big Clive has a whole bunch of really good videos on UV and I'd say they are a prerequisite for any project like this. I'll link to them below. I'm going to say this a few times, but I need to be clear on this. UV is a dangerous tool and all dangerous tools require skill. If you try to learn that skill as you go along rather than educate yourself first, you will almost definitely get hurt. So if you decide to work with UV, please take the time to educate yourself first. Don't just wing it. You won't know you are hurt until it's too late to do anything about it. That said, it is possible to work with UV safely if you work carefully and use the correct equipment. If you do this, it is a powerful and useful tool. Now, as many of you know, Hong Kong is about 40 kilometers or 15 miles from me. They're very close and they're facing a really bad surge. It's complicated by the fact that the housing is very, very dense there. It's often hard to get the ventilation and filtration in some of those small rooms and apartments where it's really needed. And the same is happening many other places in the world where people live very tightly packed in and whatever else happens, that vulnerability is always going to be there in terms of respiratory infection. So we really need to look at ways to address that. UVGI or ultraviolet germicidal irradiation uses light at around 254 nanometers and it's an incredibly strong, well-proven, well-studied germicidal. It's been used to kill everything from measles to tuberculosis going all the way back to at least the 1930s. The problem is, of course, that it's a little too good at killing things like your skin and eye cells. 222 nanometer for UVC light solved this problem and is skin and eye safe but it's still very expensive until the price on that comes down. For low cost applications, we, we are stuck with 254 nanometer light. It's scary stuff. It can cause a lot of damage in a few minutes before you even realized it. Think of it like a welding torch, but it doesn't look very bright. So you don't instinctively look away or wear a face shield. This means that it can only be implemented with a great deal of care and a lot of places avoid using it at all rather than take the risk. I think things are down enough in some places to justify that risk. No, UV is not safe. It's not ideal, but we are not in an ideal situation. Lots of places don't need it, but for the places that do, that needs something they can afford things really are that bad. I don't think we should turn our back on them because engineering is hard and we can offer something perfect. Using UV is a skill, but skills can be learned. And once you have that skill, UV is a very cost-effective tool. One very safe way of implementing UV is to put the lights in the ventilation system but this costs quite a bit to engineer and retrofit. And some of the places we're talking about barely have windows, let alone ventilation system. Generally, UV lights are not very effective in standalone air filters because the air moves through too quickly. So it's not exposed to the light long enough to kill viruses. Sometimes you see schemes that put UV lights in a box or two with a fan at one end in the hope that they can both shield the dangerous light and it irrad radiates the air coming through killing any pathogens. This generally does not work very well and it takes up quite a bit of space which people who live with their whole family in one or two small rooms really don't have. A less safe but more effective way to implement UVGI 
is to only irradiate the upper part of the room above people's heads. This is incredibly effective at killing viruses. All the studies with the exact numbers are below. But this needs much more careful installation and the UV fixtures required usually cost over a thousand dollars each. So what I'm going to make today is an open source upper room UVGI light fixture for small rooms like the ones in Hong Kong and elsewhere. Now this is like an open source chainsaw. It's still very, it's still a very dangerous tool and you still have to know how to use it safely. But it tackles one part of the problem with implementing upper room UVGI, the affordability and supply chain issues of the fixtures themselves. With any luck, local universities and maker spaces in locations that need this can take care of the other part, safe installation. Under no circumstances can these be handed out to people for them to install themselves. You need a UV radiometer and you need to know what you are doing. We'll get into that in a minute. The design I'm using is a hanging pendant lamp, lock a wall lamp. Pendant lamps are much easier to make and much faster to assemble. And since for safety reasons, these are very powerful. It's important to be able to make a lot of them cheaply and quickly. Okay, this is the design I came up with. It has 10 discs. These are our louvers that direct the light out the sides rather than down. By changing the radius of the discs and the space between them, we can alter the angle of the light. Right now, the light shines down at a very conservative 4 degrees. This is very safe, but it also means a lot of our light is getting blocked. That's okay, safety first. Let's go drop this into light burn. As always, we need to use the right tool for the job. While 3D printing is great, it's also quite slow and something as large as a light fixture would take days to print. That may be an option to pursue later, but for now, laser cutting only takes a few minutes and the materials are low cost. My design uses 2mm thick material, but you can play around with that. I've tried a few materials. Oddly enough, thin plywood seems to offer the best combination of durability and low cost. Acrylic is just a bit too brittle and we want to make sure our boat has some protection. Assembly takes a little practice. I've 3D printed these little tools to make it go faster. Once you get the hang of it, it only takes a few minutes. Okay, let's talk light sources. You've all seen this. This is a compact fluorescent lamp or CF elbow otherwise known as a low-pressure mercury vapor gas discharge lab. The electric current excites mercury vapor, which produces ultraviolet light that then causes a phosphor coating on the inside of the lamp to grow. See that white stuff? That's the phosphor coating. When the UV hits it, it glows white and filters out most of the UV light, so this is safe to use at home. This one is also mercury vapor, but no phosphor coating to grow, so it just emits UV light. 
and a lot of it, enough to damage your eyes very quickly and your skin shortly after that. Why friendly light? Burning that light. Why friendly light? Burning that light. We are going to set that UV lamp aside. One of the ways we're going to make all this a little safer is by using our white light for as much of the setup as we can, and then only swap in the UV light at the last stage. Now, when we are using power, power tools, we usually see a spinning blade or something where the danger is can be seen and avoided. The problem with UV is we don't really see it. The damage is done slowly, so you don't feel it or know about it until it's done. The way we deal with that is with very brief exposure, PPE, UV shielding glasses or a face mask. I like to wear a sweatshirt because why take any skin damage if I don't have to even a little? And last, a radiometer. It measures the strength of the UV light. A radiometer is absolutely required for UVGI installations because even a little bit of UV light le leakage over the course of months or years in a living or workspace could raise your risk of skin cancer. I have two meters here. This one measures just UVC and costs about $70. And this one measures from 200 to 450 nanometers, has all sorts of bells and whistles and costs $3,000. No, I don't have that kind of cash and no, I don't have a sugar mama. There was a donor interested in this project who wanted to remain anonymous for now. But what's very curious was sort of the numbers it put out and was kind or crazy enough to buy me this thing so I could tell them and test it properly. The good thing is, I can use the expensive meter to check the accuracy of the cheap meter to see if other people can use the cheap meter when they install UVGI and keep our costs down. Now, let me cover up and give it a try. It goes without saying any pets need to be in another room for this. Their eyes and skin can also be burnt by UV. Okay, I've got my UV protective glasses on, or at least I hope they are. So the first thing we're going to do is test them and make sure they work. Okay, the UVC number shows 208.50. Now let's put the face shield in front of it and test again. And now the UVC number is 2.26. That means it blocks most of the lights. Okay, that worked. And next I'm going to switch to my glasses. We're going to test the muscle. So the UVC number for the glasses is 3.93. That means it brought UV light also. In case you're curious, my gloves, uh, they brought UV light also. See, zero. There is a little skin showing on my rigs, but I'm just going to keep the light on for a few seconds. If I was going to do this every day, you can be sure I will definitely keep that cover up. Okay, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to test the cheap $70 radiometer against my $3,000 radiometer to see if this one is good enough for installations. So now it says 138, and let's check on our expensive meter. 147. So there is a bit of an offset, but I'm going to test it as I work. 
Okay, now I'm going to test the LED UV light bulb. These are very popular right now. Let's put it in and see what kind of number we get. Oh, on, on my laptop, I can see it's around 450 nanometers. So this is not even UVC light. This is just purple light. That this is a huge problem. There are a lot of fake LED UV light coming out of China now. Let's test it with the chip meter and see what number it shows. It doesn't even show a number, just zero, because this is fake. This is not UVC light, and this is a UVC meter. Okay, we will discuss it another time, but for now, you can trust LED UV lights. Most of them are fake. Okay, now let's start testing the fixture. Okay, as I've already mentioned, what I've done with this project so far is address upper room UVGI cost and availability. An installation protocol really has to be decided on by professionals. So no, this is not a tutorial. I will, however, go over the major considerations as outlined by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers, and a few other reliable organizations. Links to all this in the description. I put the lamp fixture on the end of the spoon so we can move it around and see how it works in different locations. Obviously, it's intended to hang from a hook or be mounted to an electric box in the ceiling. First off, this UVJ fixture is designed for very small rooms. No, you can't use a bunch of them in a large room. That's because the line leaves the fixture at about a 4 degree angle. So if you get far enough away from it, that UV will shine right in your eyes. The lowest the UV is allowed is 2.1 meters. So I put pieces of tape on the walls to mark that point. If the ceiling is too low or the fixture is too far from the wall, the angled ultraviolet light will hit below that point, which is not okay because that means it might hit people. The maximum size room this should be installed in is 4 meters by 4 meters. Anything larger than that and the light will probably hit too low and you won't really have sufficient power to cheat the air in the upper part of the room. For safety reasons, I kept the fixture pretty underpowered. Ideally, the fixture should be hanging at or near the center of the room. You then measure the distance to the nearest wall, and this chalk will tell you the minimum height to the bottom of the fixture to keep the UV well above everyone's head. Obviously, higher is safer and better. The great thing is, we can figure all this stuff out with a leather, some painter's tape, a tape measure, and the fixture with a white light inside. Perfectly safe. If the white light hits below 2.1 meters or the bare white bulb can be seen from the doorway or adjoining room, we know that it's not safe and the room is not appropriate for installing it. The idea is to do as much of the setup as possible with the white light and not switch over to the UV light until the installation is almost complete. Okay, about 217. Okay, it's about one meter away from each wall, which will be a two by two room. We'll pretend it to like a bathroom, a very small room. Okay, I've dimmed the light, and as you can see, the white light is above the mark on the wall, so I'm going to swap out the UV bulb. 
Okay, is that it? Not even close. We still have to measure what's known as a threshold limit weather. How powerful the UV is in the lower part of the room at eye level in order for it to be safe long term. We need to make sure it's below 0.3 microwatts per square centimeter. Remember, if you have a white wall or other shiny surface that can reflect the UV light down into the lower part of the room. So we want to move in a grid pattern, point our meter in every direction and hunt for hotspots any place where there is UV leakage over 0.3 microwatts per square centimeter. Because of the relatively low power of this fixture, this is fairly easy and I haven't found any hotspots yet. But you need to put the time in and check carefully. Look for anything that could be reflecting UV into the lower part of the room. Okay, UVC 0 0.10. Okay, EUVC is 0.14. Okay, now the EUVC is 0.12. There also needs to be a decent amount of air mixing to ensure that the air in the bottom of the room is slowly moved to the top and exposed to the UV light. With our application in a small room, a pedestal fan or even a fan clipped on the shelf is sufficient. A ceiling fan on the lotus setting is okay, but you don't want turbulence that may result in the air moving through the upper part of the room too quickly to be treated. Just a slow mix. You cannot go without this. Upper room UVGI is about 80% less effective without air mixing. One of the largest issues is this fixture cannot under any circumstances be used in rooms with bunk beds. Later on, if there's interest, I can make more directional models. But for now, just don't do it. The risk of it shining on someone sleeping or sitting in the upper bunk is too great. Think about hallways and bathrooms with exhaust fans. It's absolutely ideal for that and can be used very safely to great effect. Most places that have been illegally subdivided into rooms are linked by corridors that provide ventilation and so transmission. Likewise, Shared bathrooms or facilities are a huge source of transmission due to fecal aerosols. Just be careful with white tile. It can reflect quite a lot of UV, so measure carefully. Having UVGI in those places means that one family getting infected won't mean every family living there gets infected also. Lastly, ozone. If you smell it, you purchased the wrong UV bulb. Be sure to specify ozone-free when you buy your ultraviolet light source. Again, this is not a tutorial on exactly how to install an upper room UVGI fixture, but a starting point so that people know what is involved. Okay, if you are interested in this project and understand that a great deal of care is required, there is information in the description box. This project is best suited to universities or makerspaces that are willing to learn how to install these safely and that have the ability to work with their local communities to get that done. While upper room UEGI has been used safely for decades, there is an element of risk and that risk is only justified when there is an immediate and significant danger posed by airborne pathogens which unfortunately is very much case in some parts of the world. If the risk is too great for your application or if where you live has ample resources for other interventions, consider yourself lucky. And remember, people elsewhere are faced with harder choices and have the right to make those choices themselves. What I've done here is make an evidence-based non-pharmaceutical intervention affordable and somewhat easier to implement. 
local communities working with local experts can decide if it's suitable for them. That decision for or against the use of this particular tool should not be imposed by well-meaning outsiders. If you are looking for something a little more DIY, I highly recommend the Corsi Rosenthal box. It's a very effective air filter that you can easily build if you live in North America and it's very safe to implement. Far safer than UVGI. Unfortunately, it's loud, more costly, very large and harder to implement in Asia. So not perfect for every use case, but it is a powerful tool and should be one of the first you consider for treating indoor air. That's it for today. Let me know what you think or what ideas you have in the comments, and I'll try to incorporate that in the future. And just this once, no, just because you've just seen me do it does not mean you should have a try. Please use good judgment.